Did you know FDA-approved Vivgot, Fgotigamod Alpha FCAB, is available for your adult patients? Visit vivgothcp.com to see the data and explore how it works. Vivgot is a registered trademark of Argenex. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Tisha Manteith with the Neurology Podcast. June is Migraine and Headache Awareness Month. The American Academy of Neurology wants to highlight this given the incredible levels of disability that our patients with migraine and other types of headaches suffer. Well, I have a special treat for you today. With me to discuss a little bit about migraine is Masuda Shina. He is the senior author on a paper, Diagnosis and Management of Migraine in 10 Steps, which was published in Nature Reviews in the summer of 2021. It's been heavily circulated, and I thought that we should focus on this today. Masood Ashina is a professor of neurology in the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, University of Copenhagen, and director of the Human Migraine Research Unit at the TEDx Center. Welcome, Masood. How are you? Thank you, Tisha. Thank you for inviting me. So, Masood, explain to us how you can diagnose and manage migraine in 10 steps. We all know that the migraine is a very prevalent. We know it's underdiagnosed, undertreated. And some of my young or junior PhD students start asking me the questions about the migraine. And they told me, why it should be so complicated? Why don't you have nice a clinical decision making? And they presented me a paper on the completely different topic, which was also at 10 steps on the diagnosis and treatment of another condition. Well, I start reading that. I say intuitively, it's a very nice, you know, to create a 10-step approach to the diagnosis and management of migraine. So what we did is that we introduced very typical clinical features, diagnostic criteria, and also uh, important aspects of patient centricity, education, which is very important to ensure successful treatment, in particular, adherence and satisfaction with this treatment. And we would like also to outline which is which what we consider the best practice for acute and preventive treatment. We also touched upon some different populations that could be also relevant in clinical practice. So we basically provided also recommendations to evaluating the treatment response. And we discussed the different aspects such as uh, complications of migraine, comorbidities, which can also affect short and long-term management. So it sounds like your goals were to just make things a lot easier for people, given the prevalence and major disability of migraine. And of course, our listeners are going to have to read this paper to get the details of your diagnosis. But kind of just generally speaking, give us a few highlights of when to suspect migraine and diagnose migraine. We have to remember that we diagnose migraine not based on the blood samples or doing uh, imaging. Migraine is uh, diagnosed based on the clinical characteristics and the history. So we need to record medical history, and we all know in neurology across all subspecialities that the history is not given, history is taken. So it's a very important aspect of uh, management migraine. We apply diagnostic criteria. We're so fortunate in the headache field. We have international classification. So we can diagnose migraine in the same way in the different countries. Well, we are in North America, we're in Europe, we're in Africa, we're in the Middle East, in Latin America or Southeast Asia. This is the same. So this is an incredible achievement in our field in headache medicine and research that we have diagnostic criteria and we need to apply diagnostic criteria to diagnose. Then we also need to consider differential diagnosis and we must examine patients to exclude other causes. Not because they are frequent, but it is a part of the consultation and part of the diagnosis of migraine to examine the patients and if it's necessary to use neuroimaging only when a secondary headache disorder is suspected not just, uh, you know, ordering the MRI or the CAT scan. So it's important here. So neurological examination, it's a part also of this diagnosis. But if we try to simplify that, we can say the following. Any kind of recurrent, stereotype, self-limiting 
headaches associated with uh, typical features of migraine, such as photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, or sometimes vomiting, it is a almost 100% migraine, okay? It is just on and off. And we also know that some of the patients, they might also experience so-called migraine aura, so self-limiting uh, focal signs, usually there are visual disturbances presenting like a zigzag lines or scintillating scotoma, which is usually before the headache starts and lasts about 20 minutes up to 60 minutes. It's a gradual evolving over the space and over the time. So we call them aura and one third of migraine people are reporting aura symptoms. So let's move a little bit into the acute and preventive treatment. For acute and preventive treatment, you offer first line, second line, third line options and adjunctive therapies. So do you want to just kind of go through that? Acute treatment is very, very important. Remember that most of the patients coming to our clinic, they complain of recurrent attacks and, and, and they want something that can abort their attacks. Okay, before they start talking about prevention. A priori patients are very, you know, they hesitate when we talk about preventative treatment because prevention means you take medication every day. And this is not, let's say, a super popular approach if you do it from the beginning. Usually we start talking about abortive treatments and acute treatments. The reason that we have a first line, second line, and third line, they will have different reasons for that. You can ask me why the first line are NSAIDs, you know, why, you know, ibuprofen or diclofenac, you know, they're the first line. The reason for that is that the vast majority of the patients, when they start having attacks, they go to the pharmacy, and the first thing they do, they get the medication without prescription. And we know that the most of these medications are NSAIDs. So they start taking these medications. And if they're working, they don't need to go to the second line medication. So this is what we call step care approach, which is a more, let's say, popular in Europe if we compare with North America, especially in the United States. I can mention another approach in the U.S. So basically, based on this very practical and reality that the patient starts first with NSAIDs and they're happy, they can continue. If they're not happy with this medication, they usually go to the GPs. And here it's very important. They can get prescription on triptans. And triptans are the first migrant-specific abortive medications introduced in the beginning of 90s. And unfortunately, still not many patients getting this treatment, which is uh, very unfortunate because 30 years passed. Triptans provide, in the most of the cases, sufficient pain relief or pain freedom. If not, you can, in fact, combine them with the fast-acting NSAIDs. This is also important. It is possible, and it's also evidence-based. And then we are very fortunate in migraine uh, the headache field that we have a new medications, which we consider in this step care approach, the third-line medications, the GPANs. They are small molecules, antagonist against the GRP receptor. And we have uh, DITANs or DTANs. They are 5 h a one F receptor agonist, so they work on the specific serotonin receptor called subtype called 1F, and this is a different from uh, triptans because they work on the 1B, 1F, and 1D receptor subtype. So they kind of non-specific in this context, but this one is a specific or 1F. So we can use this one, and the only one is lasmiditan. And for the GPANs, we have two labeled uh, registered uh, GPANs. Ubrojipan and, and Rimajipan, so we can use them. The reason for third line is that because in Europe, we have very strict policy about the prices and reimbursement. That's why people must try triptans first before they go to the next generation medications, DTANs and GPANs. You can also have adjunct medications, like you mentioned before, but those are for nausea or vomiting. If patients cannot intake the medication, they can get prokinetic antiemetics, and we use usually domperidone and metoclopramide in Europe. So those not to enhance efficacy of these medications that I mentioned before, first, second, and third line, it just to prevent 
nausea, and also make sure that the patients can intake oral medications, okay? So this is very important for the acute treatment. And acute treatment is usually evaluated uh, on pain freedom. Two hours, it's very, very important, and that's why one of the steps we have, uh, step seven, is evaluation of treatment response. And for the acute treatment, we suggest two hours pain freedom and also uh, sustained pain freedom for 24 hours, meaning that the patient don't relapse or, or they don't have a recurrence. They have sustained effect. This is the best you can offer to the patient that they can take a medication which works in two hours and then it's sustained for 24 hours. So most medications that we see in these steps are evidence-based. We cannot provide ranking at present because almost nothing we can say about the head-to-head trials. So that's why we provide this step care approach. In US, our colleagues are also using a so-called stratified, I think, approach which is say that if patients have a mild head pain during the attacks, they can start treating with NSAIDs, but when they get to the moderate to severe, they can get a triptans as a first-line medication. So this is the only difference we have. But there is some debate which one is, let's say, the most appropriate. I think the both approaches are fine. This is what we do basically in Europe with this step care approach, and we had a consensus on that. Yeah, on the benefits of stratified, you know, if a patient really knows their type of migraine and starts mild and they know it's going to be at level 10 in two or three hours, you may want to just load up quickly, right? Exactly, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the preventive treatment options, and this really focused on the pharmacological interventions. We know that there are devices, there are other non-pharmacological interventions, but let's talk about the pharmacologic steps. Pharmacological steps and preventative treatment, okay? In our paper, it's a step uh, five. We had a discussion about recommendations, you know, when we need to recommend the patient's preventive treatment. Well, we, in this consensus, we agreed that patients affected on at least two days per month, despite optimized acute treatment, then we can offer them. You can say, well, I mean, it's only two days, but but people who experience migraine attacks, those two days are really tough. Then we say, what about the first line, second and third line? And again, we have approach which is based on the reimbursement, based on the availability of medications and many different factors. And that's why the consensus was that the first line medications are beta blockers, topiramate and candesartan. We also have a second line medications, not available in all countries. Fluorazine, not available in all countries. It's a calcium channel blocker, amitriptyline, and sodium valproate. And remember, this is a consensus based on the many authors, the different opinions, different experience, and collecting all the evidence so far. Sodium valproate, I would say very, very few patients are treated with that. We know about the teratogenic risk of the, using the sodium valproate, especially in female population. That's why it is not something that we used a lot. For the amitriptyline data, I can say, well, the evidence is also not a super, uh, but High doses are required, and the high doses are associated with the side effects. And this is also one of the limitations of this medication. But the first line, the beta blockers, topiramate, candesartan, I widely use. And then we have the third line medications, again, based on availability and reimbursement rules in Europe, CGRP monoclonal antibodies. Uh, monoclonal antibodies against calcitonin-generated peptide itself or its receptor. So we have four monoclonal antibodies we can use for the prevention. And we also have, I know that now in US, two GPANs. The both GPANs, the small molecules, they're also registered, approved for the prevention of migraine. So they can be used on the daily basis, auto-GPAN and every other day, Rima-GPAN. So this is, let's say, a migraine-specific medication. And we all know that with the migraine-specific medications, such as monoclonal antibodies and GPANs, when we use them as a preventive, we see experience-based, we see a nice adherence and persistence with these treatments, and we see a few side effects. Because when you have a medication which are targeting specific mechanisms, 
the likelihood for efficacy is very high and the likelihood of tolerability, you know, the well-tolerated uh, drugs are also very high. So we are, again, very fortunate in our field that we have so many medications we can offer our patients. So uh, I guess the only thing about this here, and I see that you'll talk about chronic migraine separately, but maybe a little dot for disability and making a case for using CGRP monoclonal antibodies sooner in the case of high frequency or very disabling attacks. We can also say that this frequency, it's also very relative, right? Let's assume that you have a patient having a two days a week migraine, only two days. It will be eight days per month. And if you multiply with 12, 96 days. So just imagine that 96 days of uh, people with migraine, and these days cannot be adequately controlled with acute medications. It's a huge, huge impact, okay, on patients, individual impact, but also on the society. So and just imagine that these 96 days can be not eliminated by 75% of the base case scenario. You know, it is amazing how much you can achieve. So that's why I'm careful when we talk about the, the frequency. I'm talking about individualized therapy according to patients' symptoms and needs. Okay. And that's why the step three is very important in this context. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Um, let's move on to uh, the management of migraine in special populations. You do a nice job of talking about how to treat older people, children and adolescents, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, and women with menstrual migraines. So what tips do you provide? First of all, I'd like to, to draw more attention to these special populations because I would say there's kind of discrimination, especially in terms of the clinical trials, not including these patients. So this is a very, very important to state that there is a poor evidence, you know, for all drugs in this age group. We're talking about the children, adolescents, you know, it's also important that their presentation can also sometimes differ from migraine that we see in adults. And another important thing is also children, adolescents, they usually involve this uh, dynamic between the schools, parents, and this is important when we talk about the management. Then there is also a special population, women who are uh, pregnant or breastfeeding. Well, in this situation, we know that we have some limitations. We have our possibility to use and medications that we usually use, we cannot just use them for free here. And uh, usually we offer them paracetamol for acute treatment. And uh, some of the databases suggested that the sumatriptan can be used during the pregnancy, also breastfeeding. The good thing is that during the pregnancy, the frequency of migraine goes down. It is reduced substantially, gradually, and sometimes the second and third trimester, people with migraine, they report no migraine attacks. Unfortunately, most of the cases uh, relapses after uh, postpartum and during the breastfeeding period, it can be really disabling. And here again, we need a special approaches. And we have in our step six, some of the, let's say, tips that we usually we suggest in terms of the treatment. Women with a menstrual migraine, uh, well, I would say that most of the women experience menstrually related migraine, not necessarily a pure menstrual migraine, it's, which is rare in my opinion. So perimenstrual preventive therapy can be used and, and we can also use the long acting NSAIDs and also triptans during this period. And I also envision some of the new drugs such as GPANs also for this treatment. And this is something that should be studied in the future. Great, and then let's move on to evaluation and treatment response as well as medication failures. The step seven, evaluation of treatment response and management of failure, extremely important, Tisha. And the reason for that is that we need to follow our patients. We cannot just prescribe the medication and say, well, now you can go back to your GP, or if you are a GP, you know, this is a treatment and we don't have any follow-up. What we need, we need headache calendars. I know that it sometimes can be, let's say, some kind of irritation from the patient's side, say why I should fill out all the time this calendar. But we need to see whether the treatment that we offer them makes any sense, you know, in terms of the effectiveness. And also, if patients have adverse events, we need also to register them, especially with the new treatments. You know, we learn about the new treatments. 
And we have to exert pharmacovigilance in this context. Why don't you just let us know what you consider the number of tries for acute and also the time period for prevention? What is important is we try different triptans. And the reason for that is that there is evidence that there is a efficacy can vary, you know, from one patient to another patient. So some patients are responding to one of the triptans and not responding to another triptans, or they're having side effects with one triptans and not having with another one. And because, again, about the reimbursement rules and, and also the efficacy, excellent efficacy of the triptans, we need to try the triptans. For the preventive medications success, it is very important to emphasize that prevention, it is not freedom of migraine, it's controlling the migraine, it's uh, reducing the frequency of attacks, the intensity of attacks, and also duration of the attacks. So these three main parameters that we usually target when we evaluate preventive treatment. You might have a very happy patient, not reporting changing in the frequency, but has really significant efficacy on intensity. I agree completely. And I would uh, just say one of the common mistakes minus tolerability issues is that sometimes patients stop their preventives early. So ideally two or three months on a, a good dose of an oral preventive. I don't know what you do for the CGRP monoclonals if you try and hit that. The same, Tisha. I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, I know that, that the many people say, well, some of the drugs are working fast, you know, in a week or two weeks, etc. I never say that to my patients. I always say that, well, recommendation is that, especially when we talk about the newer medications, you know, the targeting CGRP, I say we need to try one drug at least three months, unless they have some side effects, of course, and they're not tolerating. It's a different situation. If they tolerate, we need to uh, evaluate in three months. And then, of course, there are some of our more refractory patients that might need to be exposed to CGRP monoclonal antibodies for six months because we know that there are some later responders. Absolutely, you are correct. Uh, based on some of the real world uh, studies, we see that there are about 25, sometimes up to the 30% of the patients, they might experience efficacy later. So it takes time for some of the patients. So that's why uh, individual approach is important here. So now let's focus on step eight and nine, management of complications and recognizing and managing comorbidities. Yeah, we know that the complications of migraine, usually when we say complication, we mean the chronification of migraine, okay? The migraine becomes chronic. We all know about risk factors for chronification. Some of them are modifiable, some of them are not modifiable. Let's say not modifiable, it could be that individual threshold, it's so low and the migraine is so aggressive in specific cases, that's very, very difficult to manage that, right? And could be different factors explaining that. Could be genetic factors and let's say the pain perception. So different things that can explain that. But most of the factors that we're talking about in the clinical practice are modifiable and medication overuse, one of the most important ones. Why? Because we know that the triptans are one of the drugs that can induce medication overuse headache. These patients are complicated, but what we usually do, we give them uh, advice. We give them education about the risk of developing of medication overuse, especially with the triptans and combination medications containing codeine, containing caffeine. And what we advise them to reduce them and immediately initiating the preventive treatment. Because by giving the preventive treatment, you can also help them you know, to reduce the number of days when they take acute medications. And we see that in some of the new trials that you can nicely do that. And also some of the randomized trials with the different medications, with the non-specific medications, also showing that with a simple advice or some kind of intervention like education by nurses or other healthcare professionals in combination with the preventive medication can be very successful. But with the newer drugs, you know, the GPAS, which are used as an acute medications, we don't really see any biological, let's say, risk of developing of medication overuse because they're also used for the prevention. So that could be a good option for some patients with a high frequency migraine. Let's focus a little on the comorbidities. Yeah, when we talk about the comorbidities, people usually mention depression and anxiety disorders. 
Well, it's very important to recognize that epidemiological studies suggested a high prevalence of migraine in population with depression and anxiety disorders compared to the background population. And vice versa, in population with migraine, we see a higher prevalence of depression and anxiety disorders compared to the background population. But this doesn't mean that this is migraine is a cause of depression or depression is cause for migraine. Okay, those are just two comorbidities that they coexist in the the vast majority of patients that we see in the specialized clinics. But those are challenging patients. But one thing is very important, controlling depression, successful treatment of depression, never ever in my clinical practice led to, let's say, migraine freedom or the reduction of migraine in such extent that the patient doesn't need any preventive treatments, okay? So this relationship is quite complex, so not because the depression causing the migraine. So this is very important. There are two different conditions, A and B, should be managed separately in the multidisciplinary clinics, ideally with the involvement of psychiatrists, if patients need, let's say, treatment for depression. But we also see some patients with uh, chronic migraine reporting uh, symptoms suggesting depression. They call depressive symptoms or anxiety symptoms. And they are sometimes vanishing uh, or reduced by the successful treatment with the preventive medications, including with the new medications. So it's very, very important to, to keep it in mind when we talk about the comorbidity or just reaction for the migraine. But if comorbidity is there, it should be managed. There are also some other comorbidities, such as the cardiovascular diseases. Those can be also relevant for the acute and preventive medications, and that's why we need to recognize them, and if it's necessary, to make a case-by-case decisions. Okay, so now step 10, (laughs) planning long-term follow-up. How do you do it? And, And I know it's different between subspecialty clinics, tertiary centers, and primary care. But how do you do it? Yes, Tisha, this is a very important part. Migraine is a highly prevalent disease. Just imagine that in American population, more than 300 million people are reaching probably 400 million. You have a 15% of the population uh, suffering from migraine. So it's a huge number. So it's impossible to manage them in the specialized practice or in the hospital outpatient clinics. You need primary care physicians there. What is important that we need to provide them good education. We need to provide them these 10 steps, you know, they can use, hopefully, and it's a free available article, so it's a free access. But what is important also when they refer them to the specialist, you know, what is important is repatriate, you know, the patients from the specialist care in a timely manner with a very good, I would say, comprehensive plan. Not just saying that, well, patients now is taking this medication and everything is fine. No, you just say that you need a follow-up and if patients reverse, you can do this and this and this. So you can avoid these patients coming back or they can try some of the things before they come back to you again. And the job of the specialists will be to maintain stability of the effective treatment before we send them back to the primary care, you know. And the primary care physicians should react immediately to any change, and if it's necessary, they can refer them back. So this kind of cycle should be optimized. I know that this is an ideal situation. It's not easy, but this is what we need to strive. Well, this is great. We got through all of those 10 steps. Well, thank you, Masood. I think that this paper is wonderful and it really is helpful in making us better neurologists as we focus on the diagnosis, acute and preventive treatments, as well as most importantly, the clinical management and follow-up. And I would like to thank our listeners for listening in to the Neurology Podcast. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please Take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.